start, started working, I suppose, in, in urban, urban ecology and especially looking at the urban fringe, I used to sort of hit my head against the wall feeling so depressed about the lack of rigour and science or even really consideration of biodiversity in planning our city. Because I have to say, when I started in 2004, there was not a lot of evidence. There were a lot of enthusiastic people in councils, a lot of people with knowledge, but there was not really much overarching policy or direction or, or really terribly much regulation around the way we actually treated biodiversity in planning our cities. And things have moved on a lot, but I still think they've got a long way to go. Yeah, a lot of people ask me why you bother working in the urban fringe or in urban areas, and I think I probably don't need to really say or argue terribly, terribly well with you guys that um, there is a need to do it. But I mean, if you just look at the statistics, our urban and urban fringe areas have you know, the lion's share of our threatened species now in Australia. It's, it's over 50% of our threatened <laughs> ecosystems, about over 40% of our threatened species that are occurring in these areas. Um, and it's an interesting historical, <laughs> you know, analysis to look at why that, that is. Um, but, you know, there's a hell of a lot of really valuable stuff that is at, 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 at threat still. And I think so, I mean, I, I, it's an incredibly fruitful and, um, and worthy work, I think, to look at uh, and preserving it. Oh, look, just some examples of ecosystems that are kind of, you know, on their way out unless we're really careful. This is the basalt plains grassland that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. I mean, what is it? Less than 1% at least left and less than half a percent. And, you know, I mean, if you look at Nick Williams' work, you'd be excused for, for sort of understanding that this is a historical losses and that we, you know, we're, we're kind of, um, we can look back on it and say, oh, at least we learnt. But, you know, we're losing a lot of it now. Since 1985, I think Nick's study was 1985 to 2000, we lost 50% of what was left in that, you know, before, before he started his study. And since then, I'd imagine it'd be a heck of a lot more lost. Uh, and, you know, really, I think this, this ecosystem is in a lot of trouble. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is down to, to urban expansion. But it's not just Melbourne. We've got the Cumberland Plains in, in around Sydney. We just recently assisted with a strategic assessment of, uh, of Sydney that was bloody depressing because they're basically just signing off on losing upward of 25% of what's left now. You know, and, and that's kind of announced by the minister as a big tick and a win for the environment. Um, Swan Coastal Plain in, uh, in around Perth, same thing. Since nine, I think it was between 1993 and 2000, that period of time, 230,000 hectares of this ecosystem were lost. So these are very recent things that are happening and, and very, they're now. You know, we're actually losing these ecosystems now. So I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is we do need a shift in our thinking if we're going to preserve this stuff. It's not just the biodiversity. I think it's truly sad that we are going to potentially lose species and ecosystems. But it's just, it's the, it's the human element as well. I mean, we talked about it. Kate spoke about ecosystem services, but um, you know, it's only in the last few years I think we've started to get a handle on exactly what biodiversity does provide to us. And you know, I think Naomi Leckie and, and George are three perfect examples of people who look pretty unstressed. I mean, George, you did a pretty good job, I reckon, <laughs> considering you're not a public speaker to come up and, and, and give that presentation. But um, you know, looking at that list, it's, it's truly remarkable what biodiversity can deliver to communities and, and, and to individuals. And I think um, we have a lot to lose uh, by kind of uh, having cities that are void of biodiversity. But what are we dealing with <coughs> in terms of the planning paradigm? Well, this is it, isn't it? Now, this is actually a real, this is a real uh, billboard in Canley. Big house, big car, big success. That's me, baby. And, you know, that is actually the planning paradigm that we are battling against. And, you know, that... <laughs> it's, it's tragic, isn't it? But it's true. You know, it's a, such a wasteful of land, the way that we're currently expanding our cities, and such an unimaginative way to actually fit people into our cities. So that's why we called our project Reimagining the Suburb, because that's, what, that's where we think we really need to be thinking. We're, we're tricked into... You know, planning restraints creating a scarcity of housing and land are the overwhelming cause of Australia's high prices. I mean, these are the kind of headlines you see all the time. It's not the fact that we don't have enough land that our house prices are high. My God. We've got a 17-year guaranteed supply of land in Victoria. The developers just cannot believe it. You know, imagine what industry has 17 years of guaranteed supply. It's not housing, it's not land that is driving house prices. In fact, it's not actually affordable housing that they're creating. I mean, doesn't look like a place I particularly want to live. 
But uh, you know, people people do want to buy these houses. Uh, they do they do buy these houses, but they're not affordable. No way. They become affordable in 15 years' time. That's where the affordable housing is. When the housing stock starts to deteriorate, they become the house prices actually fall. They become undesirable places to live. Is that the kind of affordable housing that we want to be creating for our society? I don't think so. It's not what people want either. <coughs> There's actually a lot of evidence now from, uh, you know, if you look at the, the demand for housing, that people don't want to be living in those kinds of places. They're kind of cottoning on to the fact that it may actually cost slightly less than, than living in, in town, but that's actually a false economy. You know, you actually end up spending so much more money on your fuel prices. There is no local uh, uh, employment. There's little kind of, you know, local facilities and... and uh, um, and so forth. There's very high rates of depression, very high rates of, uh, of bankruptcy. I mean, one of the places we uh, have been working in has an over 10% bankruptcy rate of properties that are purchased. You know, that's kind of extraordinarily high. So I argue that that is not the future of, uh, of growing our cities in the slightest. So some people say to me, well, maybe for biodiversity, at least, offsetting is the solution, you know, and that's actually really the direction we've taken our approach to biodiversity management in Victoria. And it's a, a nice notion, I suppose, that you can clear somewhere and that you can offset that clearance by uh, protecting vegetation elsewhere in the landscape. But, you know, it's, I, think it's, I think we're tricked if we think that we're really going to end up with neutral biodiversity outcomes or a net gain biodiversity outcome <coughs> in doing that. Um, why is that? Well, I mean, even if we do it really, really well, I mean, you guys have done an extraordinary job here in the park, but you understand how difficult, if not impossible, in fact, I don't think we ever have recreated an ecosystem, have we? So the fact that you can offset vegetation, I think, is built on a complete fallacy in that way. But that, you know, that's actually given that we are trying to create ecosystems, and in, in, in a lot of cases, we get offsetting like this. This is a, this is a place where we worked in, in Whittlesea, where the developers have gotten away with building an interpretive walk made out of bronze animals, the fauna that used to live in the area as they're offset to this loss of, uh, of red gum grassland or whatever it is. You know, this is the kind of thing we see time and time again, offsetting done really, really badly. And tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't really understand how you can clear an area, put a fence around somewhere else and call that a net gain. That is a net loss. It's a recipe for losing half of everything, in my opinion, and uh, at, the very, at the best. So, no, I don't think... And you know what the other thing about offsetting is? It's not equitable. And why do I say that? Because I, what we are seeing is all these precinct plans coming up for Melbourne and the growth areas of Melbourne, where we're saying, okay, well, it's okay, we can clear the vegetation in this entire area where we're going to be putting housing developments because we're going to offset it elsewhere in Victoria. What about the people who are going to be moving into this area? Where is their natural heritage? I personally think it's a social equity issue uh, and something we should be not accepting as a, as a, as a sort of... Uh, anything like a good, good outcome. So that's our challenge. How do we get from big house, big car, big success, baby? This kind of appreciation of, of, uh, of, you know, of nature reserves as being kind of dump area, places to dump rubbish and, and, uh, and you know, not very desirable kind of places. This idea of, uh, of gardens being 100% you know, hostile. Okay, so how do we get from this kind of hostility you know, to something to dreaming up and reimagining something totally different. Places that are actually thriving with biodiversity, greenfield developments that have biodiversity at their heart, um, where we actually care for our reserves and we value them and we actually see our houses and our streets and our roofs as places where we can actually have biodiversity thriving. Well, we, I personally think that all of this is going to be lip service and, you know, just nice ideas unless we actually have a paradigm around this. What we've called a biodiversity-sensitive biodiversity urban design. We've been funded by the Maya Foundation to come up with this kind of thing. Where we've, what, what I reckon is that unless we can quantify what we mean by biodiversity-sensitive urban design and actually come up with minimum standards, we are not going to achieve very much. So just as we have with the Green Star, you know, building rating and with you know, water sensitive urban design. What we need is the same kind of thing for biodiversity. This is an example that we're building currently for the grasslands. We have all the actions on the left and we have ecosystems and threatened species all the way along the top. And then we're using a combination of expert opinion and modelling, so population viability analysis. We've worked out what, the, what each of these actions means for each of those species. And when I say that, I mean, how likely are they going to, to be 
in that site in 100 years' time or 50 years' time or even 10 years' time if we develop the site. That's what viability means, it's persistence. So we've been trying to quantify what each of these things means for persistence and actually come up with a framework. We can say, well, you guys, if you're going to develop this area, you're going to have to come up with some sort of minimum. So either you need to you know, develop some cues to care around your nature reserve and make sure that early protection happens and what have you, but you've got to come up with this minimum. So we are going you know, to, in, in coming months, try to really push this as a notion that, that all greenfield sites should try and take on. So, yeah, wish me luck. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, uh, you know, greenfield developments you know, we can make them better and we must make them better. But it is really not, I don't think, the future of where, where Melbourne should be growing. So this is another arm to our research, is actually rethinking and reimagining the way we grow Melbourne. So we're going to be running some scenarios, if you move on again, thinking about where biodiversity is in Melbourne and what does it mean if we have the open slather kind of style of development where the whole of the West is basically one big housing development. Um, you know, this is actually a a map of biodiversity valleys of Melbourne where you can see the bright blue are the really threatened areas. So you can see that the west is kind of full of threatened species. In fact, Werribee Growth Corridor has more threatened species in it than Kakadu National Park. Um, so, you know, that is, that's the current plan. But what are the alternatives? Come on, let's, you know, get a bit imaginative. I don't think it's going to take very much. And what we're planning to do is actually cost it, not just thinking about what it means for biodiversity, but let's actually put some figures around housing affordability and around the transport um, issues and around what it means in terms of those psychological you know, uh, issues that I was talking about and, and you know, how much more livable will Melbourne be if we actually rethink it and actually do development in, in drastically different ways. So um, just the last slide here, just some really, you know, this isn't, this isn't actually a, a field of, um, this is actually a rooftop in, <laughs> in um, the Academy of Sciences in California. This is a laneway in, in London. You know, I mean, I think Amy is totally right. We need to see Melbourne as having a, as limitless possibility. You know, we've got all this bitumen. Do we really need it all? I don't think so. We've got all these laneways, we've got all these rooftops. Let's bring back birds and, and animals. <coughs> but actually, I think Melbourne will be excited by that. Looking at this room makes me feel that there are enough people in Melbourne to be excited about birds coming back and, uh, and other animals coming back. So that's, that's my vision. I think we really need to rethink the way we do development all together. Something like Fisherman's Bend could be um, a really nice um, example of, of a, a way of really pushing for these, uh, these totally different and, and you know, biodiversity friendly planning um, designs that I'm, I'm trying to propose. So thank you very much.